Northlanders. On Tuesday, September 5th, the Duluth News Tribune will release its 27th episode of the Northlandia podcast, a weekly podcast that tells true stories of the unique and fascinating people and places you'll find exploring the Northland. In this coming episode, reporter Terry Cattle looks into the passion projects that have united a North Shore community. So the first one is uh, the restoration of the Knife River Depot. It's a train depot that was built around 1900 or so, originally built in uh, in and around the Leicester community in Duluth, but it got moved up to Knife River shortly after, after I want to say, oh, I'm not 100% sure, I want to say it's after 1900 at least. And it had been there for years and years and years. And when the leader of that project, Larry Ronning, actually remembers being a kid and taking the train to and from, I believe, Duluth or maybe two harbors, using that depot. And so he remembered that, obviously, as train travel wasn't as popular for a few years, you know, for several years there, uh, the depot was disused. It wasn't, it just kind of sat there. And so eventually there were plans to tear it down. And he, he didn't like that idea. Larry was very passionate about it. He wanted to see it last another hundred years in that community. So he, he and other folks in Knife River, it took a lot of volunteers, a lot of work, a lot of hours, and they made a full restoration of that depot. To give you another opportunity to see what stories Northlandia has to offer, we're providing the ninth episode here for you to listen. This episode was first released on April 29th. If you enjoy the episode, we encourage you to check out all the other episodes of Northlandia on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Enjoy. Welcome to Northlandia. A place to bring your curiosity, because here you will find curiosities. I'm Wyatt Buckner, the Duluth News Tribune, and I will be your guide as we discover the unique and fascinating stories here in the Northland. Here we celebrate the region's distinctive people, places, and history. In this episode, we take you inside a Lake Superior beachside cottage bookstore that's more than just a pretty space. Let's venture forth into Northlandia. If you find yourself walking along the shore of Lake Superior in Grand Marais, you may stumble upon a small cottage filled with thousands of books. Come on in! What are you looking for? Uh, chapter books and picture books. These are picture books about the area okay. and a little bit of everything. Cool. Is this you. your first time in here? Yeah. This is Drury Lane Books. To tell us the story of this scenically located bookstore, I'm joined again by arts and entertainment reporter Jay Gabler. Jay, it's great to have you back. Thanks, Wyatt. Glad to be here. Now, before we dive into the background of the store, first talking about how you found the story and what about it interested you enough to have us travel two hours up the North Shore. I feel like Grand Marais is to Duluth as Duluth is to the Twin Cities. It's a little smaller, it's much more scenic, and people are just obsessed with it. So I've traveled to Grand Marais many a time in recent years, and the first time I discovered this bookstore, I couldn't believe it was real. You know, you expect maybe some souvenir shops in Grand Marais, you expect some art you know, galleries, which there are. You certainly expect some food, like the world's best donuts, for example. But you don't expect that this perfect little cottage bookstore is just going to be right there on the beach side. You walk in and then you realize how excellent the selection is. And you're like, how can such an amazing bookstore exist in such a relatively small community? And I was, well, frankly, my curiosity was piqued. Yeah, because just like you, I've also been to Grand Marais many, many, many times, but I've never actually like ventured just that little further down the road to that side of the beachfront where there is just a cottage building. The inside is just thousands of books that, again, it's just kind of like you just take one little step off the road and there it is, a bookstore right with the scenic view of the lake right there. Just enough space that you could get a drone up in the air and get a nice beauty shot uh, with the, the bookstore and Lakes Pier right there. It's very, very scenic. Yeah, definitely recommend uh, your video for anyone who hasn't been able to enjoy it. It gives you a great sense of how the bookstore is just nestled right there on the majestic Lake Superior coast. It helps that it's also right behind a donut shop. The world's best donuts, as they claim. The world's best books, the world's best donuts. What more does a human being need in this world, unless you're gluten-free? Okay, now that we've set the scene, tell me about the actual bookstore itself and the history behind the building, this cottage front. 
I was really curious to learn about the history of this bookstore and this building. Fortunately, Gwen Danfelt, who is the manager of the bookstore, has been there for several years, met us and told us about the history of the building. This was built in 1905, actually, this half, and the second half behind me was a little bit later and a little, you know, there's a few different iterations, but this is one of the oldest buildings in Grand Marais, which when you're outside, it looks like a little house. And it was, it was built as a, as a settler's house. And yeah, right around 1905. There's actually a full dry basement underneath here, which is crazy for downtown so close to the water and it was chinked logs. We redid the siding in the windows this past summer. We took them off. There they were, square logs that were chinked in and just really well built. It's amazing to have a nice dry basement and a very very solid foundation. So the settlers knew what they were doing. So while we were up there, we kind of spent the, you and myself and photographer Jed Carlson kind of spent the morning slash early afternoon there and kind of got a sense of of what a day kind of looks like for her. She did some interacting with customers, did some restocking, moving around of books a little bit. And then you and you even asked her about what it is like for her to, to work in this bookstore with the lake literally right there. Yeah, it seems like a dream job, doesn't it? Is working at this bookstore on the lake as dreamy as it sounds? Well, the till does sit across from the from one of the windows. So my spot sitting at the computer and the cash register does look out onto the lake. And I kind of joke, cause I'm like, people are like, oh, you've got a great view. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm looking at my email inbox though, just like everyone else at work. <laughs> Yeah, I guess even with Lake Superior right there and a beautiful view, at the end of the day, it still is a job to certain extent. I still have the normal routinely duties that most of us have with pesky emails and such. Yeah, it's a busy bookstore. She's got a lot to do. Mm -hmm. Even for like a random morning in April before it gets like really nice weather, there seem to be a decent number of people coming in for it being a small bookstore in the off season from tourist season. Yeah, it stays open year round. She told us that locals become mainstays in the winter because, well, they have more time for reading. Gotcha. So now talk to me about the story behind the name of the bookstore, Drury Lane. The bookstore was founded in 2002 by a woman named Joan Drury, who's sort of a legend of Minnesota book life, feminism, was an advocate, an entrepreneur, an incredible woman. Gwen told us a little bit more about the remarkable woman who founded the bookstore. She was amazing. We miss her. She passed away in 2020. She did everything in books. She was an author, a published author. We still have one of her books here. She was a publisher. She was an editor. And she ran a writing retreat for women on the shore called Norcroft for many years. And then in her retirement, she wanted to have own a bookstore. It's, it's a lot of people's retirement dream to own a bookstore, especially a cute little bookstore on Lake Superior. And she she was able to do it. So today, the bookstore is owned by Kelly Kager and Kevin Kager, siblings who are Joan Drury's children. And Kelly Kager told me later that there was no question that they would continue to own and operate the bookstore after Joan's death. Gwen told us that she works to keep Joan's legacy alive through the book selection and other ways. Joan Drury had a vision of what she wanted to have in the store, and I've been able to keep it going, and it's small enough. This is about 650 square feet of selling space. I have about 5,000 books packed in here, which is a lot. She wanted excellent books. It's all new books here. We have all new, so we get to pick and choose each one, but she wanted excellent books, some new ones, but keep the older gems and have a diversity of voices. We of course have a big focus on Minnesota fiction and nonfiction and regional history, but a little bit of everything. And she, she really had a good idea of the curation that she wanted. And 20 years later, we've, we still carry that through. Yeah, I remember her talking about how basically said that she doesn't believe in ghosts because she can kind of feel the, her energy there, the, the rocking chair she used to sit in and her decorations across the space and just how it's kind of all laid out. Even though she's been gone now for a few years now, it just still has that essence of her there. Yeah, and Joan was active as an author and as a publisher before she founded this bookstore. And so she made a point when she founded this bookstore not to participate in a practice that is common in the publishing world. One thing that Joan Drury wanted to do when she first started the store was not do any returns. So because she was a publisher and an author, she was like, it's a lot of bookstores will buy the all the new books coming out and if they don't sell in six months, they send them back to the publisher, which a return and you get a credit. She's like, well, that's pretty heartbreaking for the author and frustrating for the publisher. So she says, I'm not gonna do that. This bookstore, new books, we're not gonna do any returns and we never have. And adding on to that, I know Gwen had mentioned a couple of times, that's kind of like a trial and error for her to be able to, to strike that right balance. That's, that's tricky to order just the right amount of books and to not give returns to sell everything that they have. And she definitely talked about that. It's definitely a, a challenge, but definitely that sounds very much an author-publisher background thing to do. You know that every book in that bookstore is handpicked. 
So Jay, what kind of books does this bookstore even have? It always jam packed, but there's still plenty of books around. What what do they have it all offer there? It's a general selection, general interest books, fiction. I guess graphic novels sell really well. Gwen told us, of course, there are a lot of books of regional interest. People come to town and they're curious about the Northland. So a lot of books about the natural history and you know outdoor recreation options available, the history of this region, authors who represent this region. But it's really a book where you can find a good read, no matter what your reading taste. Is, and they pride themselves on keeping a general selection that speaks to the broad interests of residents and visitors in Grand Marais. And, and I understand you're a fairly avid reader. Was there any books that stood out to you while we were uh, perusing the, the selections? I didn't dare look, Wyatt. I thought, no, no, no. My TBR, my to-be-read pile is already taller than I am. I did not dare look at a shelf. So I tried to discipline myself. Coincidentally, the day that this article and this podcast is published, Saturday, April 29th, is uh, Independent Bookstore Day. First off, was that intentional or was that just happened to work out that way? Total coincidence. Gwen pointed out when we told her when it was going to be published. She's like, that's perfect. It's Independent Bookstore Day. And by the way, Drury Lane Books, among other independent bookstores in the Northland, are having events that day. So with that, what do you think is the importance or even the relevance of an independent bookstore like Drury Lane in an ever-growing digital world, digital landscape? I think to really appreciate Joan Drury's vision, you have to think about this bookstore in historical context. This bookstore was founded in 2002, and between the mid-90s and the end of the first decade of the 21st century, the United States lost 75% of its brick-and-mortar bookstore locations. That is, three out of four bookstores closed in the United States as Amazon and other online means of bookselling became ascendant. But Joan Drury was convinced. She's like, this is the right business for this community. It will do well. Independent bookstores will remain relevant. And history has proved her right. Not only has her bookstore continued to thrive, but independent bookstores across the country are in the midst of a resurgence right now. Yeah, when we're talking about the longevity of the independent bookstore as a business, it's hard not to think about Amazon and the digital front, whether it's through tablets and Kindles or just online purchases. And you asked her, asked Gwen about that, and this was her response. What I like to joke is that we are more expensive and less convenient than Amazon, but we're cuter. And like cuter in like the grand sense, obviously the building and the location and the knowledgeable staff, but also readers, the algorithm doesn't really work. I mean, it, it can, and we're grateful for computers, but there's something about going and picking up the book and looking at it. And my favorite is when customers who don't know each other start chatting about books. Like one person's picked that up and they're like, oh, I read that. And you know that like you can take this person's word because they're not trying, they're actually not trying to sell it to you. <laughs> they don't know you, but they're, you're already a kindred spirit because you're both in the store that has nothing but books in it. Well, Gwen emphasized the importance of the bookstore's curation and selection and staffing and community involvement. It's also true that as independent bookstores go, Drury Lane Books does have a little something else going for it. It's extremely cute and very scenic. From the outside, we're so cute that some people assume it's a children's bookstore, which would be fun. I'd love to buy books for just children to fill the space because it's fun to shop for kids' books, but we have everything. And the other thing is, if you're an adult, reading is now a hobby. You don't have to read what you think you should read or what your mom thinks you should read or anything like you can read like I think I think you should read something and I hope that you find it here but like reading is a fun hobby and so if you don't like it you just haven't found the right thing yet so one thing one point we talked in length with Gwen was about Joan's desire to curate books of a diverse selection from diverse authors of many different backgrounds and at the time back in 2002 that was very much a, a new concept that not many other publishers especially large publishers are really doing quite as much as they are today yeah, I mean, the publishing industry has been talking about the need for diversity for a very long time, but it is remarkable how much progress has been made in just the last few years in terms of actually getting books by authors of color into bookstores, actually hiring editors of color at major publishing houses. There was a lot of work to be done, and there still remains a lot to be done, but the publishing industry has really come a long way in the last few years, and Gwen spoke to how gratified Joan would be to see that. I wish she was here because publishing just keeps getting better and I wish I could show her like these books are selling now and people are asking for these diverse voices and the bookstore is, has so many loyal customers and you did it. Like you built a successful, like it, it's a successful business all on its own. Like this, your dream completely worked. And when she passed away and the pandemic, you know, people were terrified that we were going to close. And I was like, well, no, no way. Like we, there's no reason to do that. Like this, it's the momentum will carry it on. So Jay, before we wrap it up here, I guess talk to me about what was your biggest takeaway from the story? And I guess, why do you feel like 
Drury Lane books fits or belongs in the realm of Northlandia. I feel like this is a series about unique places and spaces and people and historical events that you can only find here in the Northland. And certainly there are a lot of distinctive independent bookstores across the country, around the world, but there's nothing quite like this one where you walk out to the end of this road, this beautiful, scenic Lake Superior North Shore town, and there is this historic cottage full of an excellent selection of books. And you walk in and it's just the coziest thing ever. And you just feel like if you are a book person, you have found your happy place right up there against the sometimes rough, even brutal waters of Lake Superior. It's just the soft and the hard, the hot and the cold, the extremes of life come together in an incredible way in this very unique bookstore. Well, Jay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for joining us. Thanks, Wyatt. And thank you for joining us on this venture into Northlandia. To read the article for this week's column, as well as see photos by Jed Carlson and video produced by myself, visit DuluthNewsTribune.com slash topic slash Northlandia. You can find all the episodes of Northlandia on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you or someone you know has a unique story that you believe could have a place here in Northlandia, let us know by emailing Northlandia at DuluthNews.com. Join us again next week and discover the extraordinary stories that you just might miss if you're not in the right place at the right time, right to step off the beaten path with no rush to return, here in Northlandia. Northlandia.